Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. My name is Crystal Fullerton, and I am the Farm Safety Coordinator with the PEI Federation of Agriculture. Together with a grant from the PEI Workers' Compensation Board, we are proud to present to you our Building Sustainable Farmer webinar series. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Farmer Tim, a dairy farmer and advocate. Tim has been a social media agricultural advocate long before it was cool, and now has over 66,000 followers on social media. Today, Farmer Tim will discuss farmer welfare and his experience and knowledge and take you on a walk through the everyday life of today's modern farmer and correct some misconceptions about agriculture that will have you laughing at yourself while learning valuable lessons on what it takes to make it in today's agricultural sector. A few, excuse me, a few housekeeping issues to introduce before we begin. Please mute yourself during the webinar to ensure a higher quality sound for everyone. We do have a chat and Q&A section. You can also look for the box to check off in case you want to ask questions anonymously. We encourage all dialogue because we want you to get as much as possible out of these webinars. Farmer Tim does ask that you wait until the end of the presentation for all your questions, but feel free to type them in the chat. So please ask away as this session is about learning about the importance of mental health and the welfare of farmers. Also, there will be a poll during this webinar. We ask that you participate. It only takes one minute. It's a very simple yes or no and multiple choice, and it helps us and our funders determine if we're moving in the correct direction with our webinars. If you have any additional questions after the event or suggestions for other speakers, you can contact us at farmsafety at peifa.ca. We will also be providing a recorded version of this webinar at a later date, so please check our website and YouTube channel. We would love for you to share this information. For those of you just joining us, welcome. And now I'm going to pass over the webinar to Farmer Tim. Please enjoy. Perfect. All right, so thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thank you, Crystal, for um, for the nice uh, lead up there to my presentation. So this is a, a first for me. Uh, I've never done a, a webinar before and um, even hardly ever used my laptop. So uh, so bear with me, but we got uh, some great technical staff here. I've got my, my daughter, Abby, and um, my wife, Kirsten. She's actually taking care of the cats, making sure that they don't get in on the presentation. And my son, Andy's across the table having lunch and I just asked him to stay out of trouble. So. Hopefully we won't have any trouble. But um, first screen, of course, is some stereotypical potatoes. When I think of Prince Edward Island, I think of potatoes, of course. And I would have loved to have been there in person, um, but of course COVID happened and, um, and I'm not there. But believe it or not, I was there many, many years ago with a, um, a high school friend. Um, so if anyone from Prince Edward Island actually recognizes this photo, it is Anna Green Gables House in March. So this is back in high school. I was a little disappointed that there's nothing open in March, but it's the only time a farmer could go to Prince Edward Island. So I'll take what I can get. And the best part of my trip, this was before there was a, a bridge across to the mainland, was taking a ferry ride across to Prince Edward Island. And they had these handholds on the urinals and I, I just couldn't stop laughing, but I had to take a photo. It's a little bit tacky, but uh, I just had to share. So hopefully someday I'll be back. But I do have a little bit of Prince Albert Island at home with me. Um, this is a, a shout out to my friend Suzanne and she um, got me the shirt from Cow's Ice Cream, Prince Albert Island. Um, I saw they were having a, a mental health promotion. If you went in and bought some ice cream, they would, uh, you could get the shirt and it wasn't online. I was so disappointed. And we do have Cow's Ice Cream in Ontario, but they weren't carrying it. So she kindly sent it my way and it's, one of my favorite shirts and I would have had it on today, but I wear it so much, it's actually getting a bit worn out. So, so thank you to her. So I am what you call an advocate. So someone who advocates for agriculture in a positive way. And I'm sure a lot of you guys uh, and gals listening today are also advocates. Um, and my presentations generally are an advocacy. So this is a, a new presentation for me on mental health, um, but maybe someday I'll be able to share some of my thoughts about that with you. And of course, um, the whole thing about advocacy is, is sharing your story. And uh, less than 2% of the population uh, are farmers in Canada. So we need all those people out there to do their part. Anyway, getting on to farmer welfare. So 
as farmers, we, we livestock farmers, especially we take care of our animals. Um, we talk about animal welfare all the time and, and doing the best for them. But what about doing the best for us? So on social media, uh, if you follow me or, or don't follow me, I, I do like to share all my positive stories, all my good days. Uh, it could be cutting hay. It could be, as my son knows, I really like cutting hay. Um, it could be the birth of a new calf. It could be um, a bumper crop, some nice weather. But I also share my bad days. And there's no shortage of bad days on a farm, as, as a lot of you know. And surprisingly, some of my bad day posts are the most popular posts. Um, I know that sounds kind of depressing, but I think people like to associate, you know, they have bad days and they want to know that you have bad days and you're just human, right? And no shortage of bad days on the farm, like I said. And uh, in agriculture, I think uh, farmers are very good at sharing their bad days. We, we do complain a lot, but we got to be careful because we want consumers to understand that we love what we do, but we also need to share some of these unique stressors that we have so they understand what we're dealing with. So it's a fine balance. And some days are a little shittier than others, to be honest with you. <laughs> so a few of the unique stressors that farmers have. Um, one is we're social distancers. So we were social distancing before it was kind of a COVID thing. Um, a lot of us live in remote communities, uh, far away from urban centers. Uh, we live fairly close to one. We're fairly lucky, but even our neighbors are, are quite far apart. Uh, my next door neighbors, uh, our dairy farmers as well, and, and we're really good friends, but we maybe even see each other maybe once or twice a year or, or passing by in the tractors, giving a wave. Um, so we, uh, we crave for that social outlet, which we don't always get. And especially with all the uh, fall fairs that have uh, been closed down and, and egg, um, things that, that we get involved with with our communities, uh, with COVID, it's been a real stress on farmers. Um, egg societies have been able to connect with consumers and, and the farmers, you know, they go to, you know, to compete and stuff, and, but they also go to socialize. And a big example of that this year was with the uh, Ontario, our Canada's farm show uh, that we have here in Ontario. And I go every year, <clears throat> this year it was digital. And I heard they didn't get a lot of uh, a positive response from it. But uh, we go every year. I took my son for the first time last year and I always go to the dairy pavilion and uh, I go to about three feet in the door and you see somebody and you start talking to them and you pretty much spend the rest of the afternoon there. You don't really get to see much. So of course we want to see new things, but a lot of it is about the social interaction. So we just haven't had that this year. And if you follow me on social media, also know I like to share lots of beautiful photos of, of the farm, but, but that doesn't always paint a true picture of what's always happening uh, in the environment and around you. So a big example is on the weather. So right now in Ontario, um, well, it says my internet connection is unstable here. So, oh, there we go. So better again. Um, we had a bit of a snowfall. Uh, the days are getting darker. I know personally, um, my own mental health, I feel it you know, kind of closing in on me when it's getting dark and dreary. Um, in those long days, a lot of farmers are on their own or by themselves. People reach out to me, they've, they've lost their spouse or their kids have moved on and, and farming on your own in a remote community in the cold of winter, it can be pretty lonely. And then with winter comes lots of uh, unique challenges. You know, everyone has to shovel their sidewalk, but often you have to, um, you know, just sh shovel your sidewalk just to get to the feed cart or, or um, moving snow before the milk truck comes in the morning. So long before you get up early to milk your cows, you're out doing stuff, moving snow. Um, um, maybe my family needs to get to work or something. So there's all these challenges and freezing temperatures like frozen water lines, all kinds of stuff. And then the quite opposite of that is the summertime. Uh, humidity it makes me grumpy as my kids could probably uh, attest to. Um, it makes my body ache. I just don't like it, but anyone who works outside, you know, they got to do what they got to do and, and no one really loves it, but it's really hard on the cows too. So production seems to drop, um, uh, consumption of feed drops, of course, and that goes with production. They get lameness, you know, there's flies. It's like, it's just not fun. And then of course, uh, rain, it could be your friend or foe. Uh, this is a 10% chance of rain this day. We had cut a bunch of hay, uh, had it laying out and in the distance, you see that that uh, rainfall coming our way and it went right over our hay fields, seemed to miss my neighbor's hay fields. 
and, and ruined a bunch of hay. So, so that's part of farming, but it's one of the stresses that you have. The opposite of rain is drought. So this was a few years ago. Um, and that's as big as my corn got that year. So normally it takes maybe 15 or 16 acres to fill a silo with corn silage. Uh, this particular year, it took 45 acres. Luckily, I had 45 acres of corn. Um, and people say, well, that's what crop insurance is for. But sure, you have crop insurance will help, help cover the costs or some of it, but you still got to find feed. So all your neighbors are, are um, also having a drought. There's no feed around. The price of feed goes up. It's a stress. And when the rain comes, does come when you want it, it's, it's a celebration. Um, some springs, it's like, it rains and rains and rains and you just can't get on the, on the land. But I posted this in response to a friend actually and I was kind of ribbing him because it's relative, but he was upset because his golf game was canceled that day because of the rain. Meanwhile, the farmers were all just waiting for that rain. It was after a long drought and things were drying up and, and we were so happy. So like I said, it's all relative. Uh, and then you get a perfect summer, they call it the Goldilocks summer, where you get just the amount of wind and rain and sunshine and temperatures and everything's growing great. Um, and you have a bumper crop and it was like this year. So in this photo, I had an amazing bumper crop of corn and I, I was getting ready to do corn salad. So I thought I better go check it. I pulled back the, uh, the leaves on the, on the corn cob. And what did I see? It was um, this Western bean cutworm, they call it. And uh, it was a new one to me. It flew in from the States. I guess we can't blame Trump anymore for that, but uh, it blew in from the States and um, it decimated my corn crop. So not only did it eat the cob, it opened the, uh, the ear of corn up to mold and funguses that, that can later on affect your animals. So that was, that was horrible. And of course, uh, just having animals in general is a, is a stress. So uh, we try our best to keep our animals healthy and, and very rarely we get sick ones. But when we do, we really do stress about it. Um, as my family knows, I lose sleep about it. I worry about it. Um, I just probably project my emotions out, out there, but um, it's, it's very stressful. It's not about money. It's actually, you don't wanna see an animal suffer. So uh, making those decisions and you know, does that animal need to be euthanized? Those kind of things are, are really hard on a farmer, especially when you're so attached to them. There's my daughter, Abby, um, and a lot of uh, university kids now are going through this stress. I told her it's her first year of university. I said, you're gonna make new friends. It's gonna be the, one of the best years of your life. Um, you're gonna go to pubs and parties and, and all kinds of stuff. She's quite a social person, yet she's at home, stuck in front of her laptop all day. And, and a lot of kids are going through this, but one of the extra challenges that farmers have in the rural communities is, is the Wi-Fi. So this year, I find um, my friends in town, not far away, are like talking about all the Netflix series they've been zipping through during COVID while we're just trying to send an email that might take all day to send. So um, there is an issue with that, with rural Wi-Fi. I know they're working on it, but it, it's just not going fast enough. And of course, with farming um, during different times of year, so during um, now, harvest and during planting, during haying season, you put in long, long hours um, and long days, which is fine. It's, it's, you want to get things done. When you're a dairy farmer, for instance, you're still getting up the next day to milk your cows. So it doesn't matter if you're up late the night before, you can't sleep in, you can't catch up. It's every day, seven days a week. And um, that fatigue really sets in. And, and everyone knows when you don't get enough sleep, it affects a lot of things, especially your mental health. And I see my connection is a little unstable, so I'll just give a second. There we go. Uh, urban encroachment. So this is a farm two, uh, two places down from us uh, that we rent land at. And um, not blaming them, but they sold part of their land to development. And um, those houses were a, a wheat field the, the year previously. That's how fast it goes. And just having people there is a little stressful. Um, this past year, we put soybeans in this field. And... Sure enough, it was a beautiful crop of soybeans, even though we had a bit of drought. It was just planted at the right time and it started turning brown and had spots on it. And I had my agronomist come in and he says, you have um, spider mites. And I've never heard of spider mites before. 
So the spider mites, the only way to get rid of them is to spray this crop. And um, we decided not to because it's so close to the houses, it's so close to the dog park. Um, it was just probably not the most neighborly thing to do. We have a right to do it, but we also are worried about uh, repercussions of it. So, so these little things add stress. So watching your crop was a lot from spider mites because you're doing the right thing for your community. It's stressful, it makes you feel good, but stressful at the same time. Of course, with uh, all the urban encroachment, you have trespassing, we're dealing with this actually right now at our neighboring farm, snowmobiles were tearing up uh, a wheat field. Um, this was on our farm, this one photo, and all the snowmobiles decided to go past all these signs. And by spring, it was like a major highway through there, uh, lost a uh, hay crop because of the compaction from the snow and the crop couldn't breathe. Stressful, you do all you can to keep people out and you wanna be neighborly, but at the same time, it's not much you can do. Same with garbage, when you're getting close to urban centers, like garbage is being thrown at cars and ditches. A lot of people are really good at cleaning it up, but um, you get a pop can in your, in your feed, which we've had before, you can really uh, make your animals sick. Of course, my own personal health. Um, if you follow me on social media, you'll, you may remember uh, the one winter day, it was really icy a couple of years ago and uh, I'd fallen on the ice, gave myself a concussion, um, lost my memory for 20 or 30 minutes. I don't really remember how long, no pun intended. But um, uh, it, was, it was horrifying. So it was right before milking time. Ironically, I was texting my wife to uh, tell her that the road was icy, so be careful. And uh, next thing you know, you're off to the emergency room. And my kids were both uh, during, doing school at the time. My wife was at work. Um, and there's really no one there to help. So my son came back from his apprenticeship. Um, my daughter was there. And uh, neighbors helped. And we finally got through it. And to be honest, I probably pushed myself back to work a little faster than I should have just because I'm stubborn and, and the work needs to be done. So uh, it's just it's part of farming. It's a, it's a stress. Um, and then people say, hey, why don't you just take a holiday? So, and some farmers are really good at that. You know, I see my, my dairy farm friends heading off south, maybe not this winter, but uh, when you have a small family farm and you're relying on your family for the help to take a family holiday is a huge challenge. Um, and some people are easier with it than, than others, like I said, but for me, it's a stress. I, I we have a well-managed farm and um, a small farm and the cows have their own little individual stalls. So they're treated like individuals. And um, just to leave and let some stranger come in um, and take over is so much to learn. There's so many things that can go wrong. Um, are they going to look after your animals as well as you would? So I stress about that. Um, I, I'm trying to learn not to, but, but it's a challenge. And of course, with uh, supply management, thankfully dairy farmers are, have a little bit easier with, uh, with price fluctuations, but so we do a little bit of cash crop. Um, and it, I don't know how people do it. It gives me a, um, an ulcer just thinking about it, but some people sell their crop a, a year ahead before they even plant it. I, that just blows my mind. Um, but even selling it when it's ready, it's it's um, you sell it one day at a, at a think is a good price, and then you try not to look at the price again, and it might just jump up. And you're like, oh, I should have waited. Or if you wait that one day and the price drops down, it's like too late. So it's hugely stressful. And of course, politics. Um, I won't get into politics, but. Uh, uh, for me personally in the dairy sector over the last while, it's been uh, up and down uh, with our own government and, and government south of the border. Uh, consumers have been really supportive, yet there's a lot of misinformation out there too being shared about uh, supply management, for instance. And, um, and even now we're still wrestling with the government on, on compensation and, and are we gonna lose our supply management? All these kind of things are hugely stressful. Losing market share, um, and that's an ongoing thing. So we all have to deal with politics and it's just part of living, I guess. Natural disasters. Um, I had a, a friend lose, recently lose a barn to a, a fire. Another one this summer, um, I saw them posting about the tornado that ripped off, off the roof. And you know what happens? People lose houses and stuff, but can you imagine going out to the barn, seeing it on fire, um, maybe losing animals out of it, the anguish of that. And then, um, uh, trying to deal with that. So first of all, you have to figure out where your animal is going to go if they survived. Is there another farm? It could be far away. You're going to have to go back and forth. 
Uh, there's a person willing to house them for you. Uh, is there going to be enough feed? So maybe you lost your, all your feed from the summer and the fire, and it's like, there's no feed around, so you have to buy that. Then you have to make the decision, am I going to build a new barn? What kind of barn am I going to build? Am I I'm not going to build a new barn? So all these things are huge stress. So hopefully it doesn't happen to anyone out there. And of course, the internet itself. I think um, it's a, it can be a curse and it can also be a blessing, um, a great way to learn things, but it can be a ch challenge. And I think farmers feel the pressure on the outside from, from social media. Um, we kind of hang on to all the, the activists and stuff are on there. We, we dwell on all the, all the hate, but we don't always realize that the majority of people are very supportive of agriculture and, and don't buy into that stuff. But, but even then it's, it's hard not to uh, omit it. And um, to be honest, that's why I got into social media is because of the mis misconceptions on social media. And for example, you all see all kinds of stuff of how farmers horribly treat their animals or how about how milk is full of blood and pus and causes cancer and nasty things, you know, and it drives us nuts because um, we know the truth behind it, yet we're less than 2% of the population trying to battle all these mis mis misconceptions, dealing with all these other stresses in our life, and it's just one added thing, right? And speaking of activists, um, it's uh, in the world we live in, um, Dairy Farmers of Ontario is always sending us emails and we get activist alerts every once in a while. And anytime I get one, it just makes a stomach sink. Um, we're close to urban areas that they tell you to, to lock your doors, be aware of anyone coming on your farm. If they come in on mass, what to do, you know, and you're supposed to have the police handy and, and it causes anxiety. And we have no trespassing signs up now. And it used to invite people onto the farm, say, hey, come on in, I wanna show you. But now it's like, you don't really want anyone on your farm because who are these people? Um, so this was back in uh, August of last year. About a week before that, I got a message on my, on my page from a, uh, the head of the Animal uh, Liberation Front in the UK, and he sent me a very horrible message. It kind of sent chills up my spine. His profile photo had him with a couple of machine guns across his chest, and I ignored it. And the next morning I woke up and my social media was on fire with activist activity. And then I realized that he had um, shared my profile post on my page and it went across the world in no time. So thousands of people uh, of activist sites were sharing it. And a lot of these sites have thousands and thousands and thousands of followers. This light movement has a hundred and something thousand people. Um, I was getting messages from people that I didn't know saying how horrible I was, murderer and, and rapist and I should be dead and all these things. Um, and I tried to fight it. Finally, I had to take this post down. Um, I took off uh, the photo option on my page. I took off my messenger. Uh, you wake up every morning scared to look at your social media. So I'm always encouraging farmers to tell a story, get out there, be on social media. But then these kind of things happen and they prevent people from speaking up. So uh, thankfully, it happens rarely. I've had maybe two or three en masse uh, attacks like that, but it does take a lot out of you, and I wonder why I do it some days. And this was probably the, one of the comments that stood out to me, um, commented on one of my posts that uh, my funeral was going to be the greatest contribution, or the dairy farmer's funeral. So who, what kind of people say that kind of thing, right? Um, just quickly, uh, this was in Australia, uh, a mass... Um, protest by activists on a, on a family farm. I think it was a parent with two young kids. They surrounded the family, surrounded the farm, uh, hurled insults at them uh, in the middle of Australia. Not much you can do. Uh, family was terrified. And um, it was, I just can't imagine this happening. Like what kind of people do this? Uh, in Ontario recently, um, there was an individual requested the uh, release of all farm names, addresses, and our business numbers um and we fought it um finally they were just going to release their business numbers fought it again and uh finally it was resolved just last week but uh the they suspect that it was probably an activist group uh, an in individual um paid by them to, to try to put this request out and the last slide i showed you in australia something similar happened so the activists made a map of all the farms across australia so they gather organized protests and and uh, may or may not that was going to be happen, but it was stressful at the time. I don't want all my personal information out there. 
So these are just some of the stressfuls, you know, there's a lot of great things that happen on the farm. If you follow me, you, you know that, but these are some of the stresses we deal with. But what happens is some of those stresses are, are a little bit more unbearable. So um, my friend, Andrea Jones Bitten out of the University of Guelph, she's a veterinarian. She's also a researcher on mental health in farmers and veterinarians. She did a survey of 1100 producers from across Canada. And she found that 45% uh, of farmers met the criteria for uh, having stress. And 68% of farmers are more susceptible to chronic stress than the general population. And you can see why by, by what I was sharing with you earlier. 35% met the criteria for depression, 58% anxiety, and 40% of those producers would feel uncomfortable seeking help because of what others may think. And so that stigma is still there. You know, you need to cowboy up, you need to be tough. Um, a couple of years back, um, well, I've had a few friends, farm friends uh, commit suicide and, and you don't always really know um, what happens in obituaries. It's usually a farm accident or a hunting accident, right? So that's a big cover up um, because of that stigma. But I had a friend uh, who was an advocate, uh, young, beautiful, vibrant, the kind of person you, when you're around just made you feel good. And she took her life and it shocked the entire agricultural industry. And um, it's the kind of person you would never think would do that. So I thought, what could I do? And I'm posting this as an example of, of things that, that we can do just in general. Um, so quite a few years ago, I got this note in my mailbox. Uh, I was talking about our farm and my dad's farm next door. And it was just such a nice little note. Um, and it made me feel good. And I, to this day, I don't know who gave it to me, um, but I put it on the bulletin board and I'm having a bad day, I'll take a look. So I said, I have such a great following and great people. I started the I Live Because You Farm campaign. I tried to get people to post um, or to, to do, do an anonymous note to a farmer or write the letter to the editor about uh, farmers in their community. Say, do something nice for somebody. And it was overwhelmingly positive. I'm gonna to try to do something again, maybe like that before Christmas. Um, but I got my own accolades. I got cookies in the mail, of course. Um, and uh, schools got in on it. Uh, so classes were writing farmers or letters to farmers. Um, my neighbors uh, were posting things and, and letters they got in, in, in the agriculture community across Canada. And it made it all, all the way over to New Zealand. So this New Zealand farmer got uh, chocolate and money. And I like chocolate and money. So I'll give you my address after the presentation if you like. So send it my way. Uh, another friend had an open barn, brand new barn. Um, she decided to put up a, a Bristol board giving information on mental health. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Could be a source of spread. And the fairs. So if there's any fair people up here um, that follow me, thank you for doing this again. Um, fairs across Ontario put on their own tuition or, or, um, or they asked me first, which was fine. They didn't have to. But they put little booths up, inviting people to write a little note to the farmer when they're at the fair. And after the fair, they delivered them and put them in the mailboxes. So I thought that was pretty awesome. And this lady uh, is a, a photographer up in northern Ontario. And she asked me if she could use a little slogan for her social media. And she was uh, making a coffee table book of photos. And part of the proceeds were going back to the farming community. So I thought that was pretty neat. So I'm just giving her a shout out. And to go back to that little note, just uh, as an aside, so I put it on Twitter one day, it was like, uh, you know, do some at random act of kindness day, and it had so much great uh, positive feedback. But, of course, some people just don't like happy things, the activists were all over it, and taking something good to putting into something negative, and it just put a damper on my whole day. So, so it's, it's stressful. So thankfully, farmers started talking, um, trying to break that stigma. This is my friend, Leslie Kelly, who goes by High Heels and Canola Fields out in uh, Western Ontario. Her and her husband were very vocal and decided to uh, uh, talk about social media in a very uh, open forum uh, in news and everything. And through her and people like Kim Keller, um, the Do More Agricultural Foundation was formed. And it is, um, check it out. They have a great website uh, full of lots of information pertinent to agriculture because uh, agriculture really didn't have any mental health uh, uh, specifically or things specifically to help agriculture. So it's been great. Uh, University of Guelph is still doing great research. Um, uh, lots and lots of stuff coming down the channel with them. 
Um, so, so stay tuned. And social media across uh, agriculture in general, everyone wanted to get on the mental health band bandwagon. Uh, they still are, the momentum's still strong. So thank you everyone who keeps speaking up. Um, in my own community, uh, I was invited this to a panel um, um, for this on mental health and, it, and they're not even related to agriculture. So they decided, hey, we wanna help local farmers. So um, I thought that was pretty awesome. And nowhere <clears throat> I've been um, has been an empty house. So this is a local church, not too far from me. I figured there might be like half a dozen people show up. It was like people standing around the back of the room you know, it was like a waiting list to come to this uh, talk on mental health. So it just shows you that people really do care uh, about their farming community. And, and some of these people are farmers, but a lot of them aren't. They just want to offer support. And it's not just a Canada, Ontario or Prince Edward Island thing. Um, this is the uh, Blue Man um, program out of Tasmania, I do believe. And they did uh, blue farmers out of Baylor Twine to bring awareness. So I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, this is out of Australia, and I know what you're thinking, but I, you need to check them out. It's, uh, it's called The Naked Farmer, and they have uh, pictures of farmers that are tastefully taken. You don't see any parts or anything. And with the photo, it's they're kind of funny photos. Usually, um, they have a little story about their mental health journey. So um, they have a pretty huge following, and uh, th just check it out. Uh, a shout out to uh, a local ag society, the Listwell Agricultural Society. Um, they recently, uh, their ag ambassadors did uh, some fundraising and they came up with some money and they started a website called the Farmer's Toolbox, which is unbelievably awesome. I checked it out and it's chock full of resources that I've never heard of that are extremely useful for farmers specifically. Actually, it would help anybody, but um, a shout out to them. I think that's pretty neat. And applying what I've learned through social media and, and mental health to my own family, I've realized a lot of things. Um, this is my dad a couple years ago. He has a lot of trouble with uh, mobility. And uh, the one spring I, I had to talk to him, he liked to plant all the crops in the spring. I said, dad, you, you know, maybe you need to take a break. Like it's getting harder and harder to get him on the tractors. Um, you know, you earn a chance to have a rest, but instead he went and built a, a, a set of steps, extra steps on all the tractors. Uh, so we could get up there and he's stubborn, but I realized it's also uh, for his mental health, he did it. He wants to do it because he wants to feel like he's contributing, right? Another quick example with my dad, uh, he lives at the farm next door, looks after our, our heifers up there. And twice a day, he goes out with his golf cart and he goes from his golf cart to his little feed cart. And I call it his walker feed cart. So um, he had, uh, he custom built it. It's got a little pusher on the front where he can push the hay out of the way. Uh, he lowers it down to do that. And then there's a little um, a tube that angles the grain out to the side so it stays away from his wheels. So, so I realized he's going above and beyond. I said, Dad, we can just do that. It won't take us long, but he wants to do it. It's for his own mental health. One last example for my parents, and it's great to be able to use my parents on social media because they're not really on social media. So they're, they're a great target. But um, here they are on my dad's little si cell phone, which we moved up to an iPad now. Um, um, they don't get out a lot, um, probably even, well, maybe more than I do, but um, they go to church every Sunday and with COVID at church got shut down and they're at home every Sunday and it was kind of weird and they, they didn't see themselves and I realized they were missing that social outlet because it's your friends and your community, right? So we set them up uh, with Zoom and they started doing Zoom church services and, and I remember the first time I put it up they were looking at their friends and neighbors they hadn't seen for, for weeks. And um, they were so excited. They were laughing and they couldn't get over it. So it's these little things I realized that affect people's mental health. And these little things really help. And my son even brought uh, Vanilla, our famous cow, up to visit them one day, which gave him a bit of a boost. Another quick example. Um, this is my son and my daughter picking stones last spring. And I'm a bit of a slave driver, as they know. They're probably nodding in the background here, but uh, uh, we're trying to pick all these stones and it's a very stony farm next, uh, next door. And there's the subdivision back there I was telling you about. And I wanted to get it done. I was pushing to get it done and uh, they wanted to have a break. And I thought, oh, I just kind of want to get it done. So we ended up having a break and we did some rock balancing and, uh, and it is so therapeutic and it's fun. And uh, we ended up having another break and doing it. So 
um, these little things and we still got our work done. So that was pretty cool. I learned a lesson that day. And take something you don't like and turn it into something you love. So I, I build fine stone walls. My back can't really handle it anymore, but I remember hating to pick stones and then every once in a while I'll see, oh, there's one that'll be good from a wall and I'll pick it and bring it home and end up building a wall out of it. So make something you hate into something you love. Uh, when COVID happened, being outdoors was such a, a big thing. People were swarming to parks and stuff like that. And, uh, and I got thinking, you know what? We have like 60 acres of forest. As a kid, I used to always uh, explore them every weekend. And I decided one day the kids and I were just gonna go back and, and go for a hike. And we haven't done that for a long time together. And it was great just to be out there. So, so make use of what you have, right? And exercise. So um, something you can do easily if you're if you're at a property or a farm property, just throw on your snowshoes or your skis and, and just go out. Um, and I realized that I do am working hard and I am busy milking cows and stuff, but it's not the same as getting out and having that cardiovascular exercise that's good for your heart and your mind. And I will be caught snowshoeing to the barn every once in a while. And eating properly. So um, one thing I found is kind of funny, actually. I, I, I'm a bit of a mama's boy. Um, every day during the week, I would uh, mooch lunch off my mom and she's an amazing cook. Lots of butter pie at every meal or cake or something. And I lost like 15 pounds in that first month just being at home and, and sure I missed eating there, but um, I started feeling a little better <clears throat> about myself. And I still, you know, this was from uh, last New Year's, my resolution, and I still eat a little bit too much cheese, but uh, I'm working on that slowly. So working at home all the time in your own environment, um, I, on, on uh, all the newspapers and stuff come, it's like all new barns and, and robot barn facilities and all these barns you can tour and it's like, it's great, but I, you're still at home with my old barn built in the 1960s. So I decided to give it a bit of a, uh, a boost, a little bit of a paint job. There we go. Uh, so we got the barn all cleaned up. Thanks, Abby. And then my son gave the cows a nice clip job. There's, there's vanilla. Uh, he gave a little special clip job too. Put in some new LED lights, break things up, um, painted some of the woodwork and it felt like a new barn. So when you're working at home all the time, you might as well enjoy where you work. So it still wasn't new, but it was made me feel so much better. Uh, this is the Bruce Trail that goes from um, Niagara Falls all the way up to Tobermory in Ontario. It's about over 800 kilometers long. Um, my wife and I are about 200 kilometers into our hike, and <laughs> it took us about five years to get there. Um, but it's something we can do at the spur of the moment. You know, if you get a moment in the day, um, just go for a hike. It gives us a goal. So probably in another 50 years and we might get it done. I, I kind of joke that we're saving some of the flat spots for my wheelchair so she can push me around, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's something great for our mental health. Um, doing something nice for others. So in our place, it could be as simple as milking the cows for somebody. Um, another quick example is upcoming here where I live. We have our, uh, our annual parade of lights. It's our way to give back to the local community to thank them for their support over the year. And there's usually 15, 20,000 people uh, descend on my little village and we drive through. But this year, because of COVID, we're having a, uh, a drive-by parade. So the farmers are parking it in their fields along our road and uh, cars are driving by. So it'll be a little different, but it's still a way to, to give to the community and the community appreciate it. This is my wife, Kirsten. She's a veterinarian by trade. Um, and in her spare time, she volunteers for the, uh, uh, the Turtle Trauma Center or the Conservation Center in Ontario. And uh, it's in Peterborough and uh, she's a first responder. So if you get a turtle injured by a car or it's dead and the eggs have to be uh, harvested from it, um, she'll look after the turtle until it can go on to um, rehabilitation. And there's, I think there's eight species of turtles endangered in, in Canada or Ontario. And, um, it's just a way to give back and, and I help accept some of those turtles. I get to meet the people and it makes you feel really good. And then learning to take a break. So I, like I said, I'm a workaholic. I, I always like to keep busy. Um, I'm always posting about the beautiful stuff on my farm and people say, oh, I wish I could be there. And I'm thinking, yeah, 
But uh, the other day I even took a photo of the sunset and I didn't even share it on social media. I said, I'm gonna keep that for myself. So you need to stop and, and smell the roses or the hay. I like smelling hay. It's, uh, it's something that uh, I really love. Gardening, my, my kids were great um, in taking part in our garden this year. We haven't done a big garden for a long time. Um, not only is planting it and watching it grow amazing and, and working together as a family, um, the weeding isn't much fun. I can't make anything happy about that. But uh, you know, when you're done harvesting your, your crops and, and giving some away to the food banks and stuff, that stuff is, is awesome. Or just having a little campfire with your favorite cow. There's Annie and Vanilla. Uh, have a hobby outside of agriculture. So farmers are sometimes just farming, farming, farming. And, and even if you have a hobby that's farm related, like maybe um, antique tractors or something, that's great. But try to find something um, that's outside of your normal work. Uh, one of mine is astronomy. I don't do it very often. I'd like to get back into it. It's maybe not the best hobby for a farmer because you got to be up late or up early when it's dark. And in the winter, it's kind of cold. But um, it's when I'm out doing it, I just, my mind goes elsewhere and I just, enjoy the beauty of the universe. So try to find something outside of agriculture and call it your own. And with COVID this year, um, going to like our, our veterinary clinic or feed, um, our feed place usually have um, dinners and information and speakers and stuff. And that's not on, but we get lots of stuff coming in the mail, lots of learning experiences or uh, opportunities. So, so take advantage of that. Try to learn something new every day. And even COVID itself, it sucks, but try to make something of it. Uh, a great morale booster for dairy farmers is when uh, Dairy Farmers of Ontario sent these uh, masks to all the farm families. It was, it was, there's not often that they actually give us stuff like that. Um, and it's a way that you could uh, just make COVID your own. And uh, when you're out in the grocery store, people say, hey, there's, there's a dairy farmer, right? So if you're showing off what you do, hopefully you don't get beat up for wearing it. But uh, um, it's, it's been great for our mental health. So a few little notes and getting near the end now. Um, uh, I find that you need to make social media a place where people want to gather. There's lots of social media sites out there, um, even some farm pages that seem to dwell very much on the negative. Um, no offense to them, but it's like it's either all about activists or all about myths and all about how people hate us. But the majority of people do support us. So you need to make it where people want to have um, to support you and have a good time. And remember, you're never too important to be nice to people. Um, I find on social media being nice is, has buffered me from a lot of the negativity out there. I don't attract negativity, um, so I don't get a lot of it, thank goodness. And when it does come, if you're just a nice person and you show that you're the better person, you're gonna uh, and you're representing agriculture, um, you're gonna be better, way better off. And think about how you talk to people on social media. It's easy, easy to be one of those armchair warriors and, and say something that you wouldn't say on social media, but um, you got to think about, uh, would you say that to a person's face if they're standing across the, the room from you? Probably not. And be kind to un unkind people because they need it most. And I really find that people who have a lot of negativity or people are lashing out, there's something else going on with them that makes them that way. So, so be mindful. And slowly, I've been learning how to respond to people. Uh, my tongue bleeds a lot from biting it a lot. But um, you always have to... Uh, be Think about how you're going to respond to people like they can be negative to you, but you don't always have to be negative back. So one little thing I promised Crystal I'd throw in here um, was if you're being bullied on social media, I'll just go this through this quickly. There's a few things you can do. One is don't poke the bear. So first of all, don't, uh, you know, don't go out of your way to cause controversy in the first place. I had a friend's not too far away. They have a farm store. They sell beef and they sell vegetables and stuff. And they decided to uh, put up a sign. It was kind of funny. It says, um, uh, being a vegan is a big mistake, pun on the steak part. And they got trounced on. And they didn't realize that a lot of their clientele were vegans because they sell vegetables and stuff. And um, they had to shut their social media down. They had people picketing outside their store. Um, it was horrific. So, so don't go out of the way to, to stir up trouble. And always engage in polite conversations, um, even if you disagree. Um, like I said, you need to be professional, you need to be polite, and uh, it's gonna get you a lot farther 
and um, people are watching how you converse on social media. They may not always, not always be vocal, but um, they're there listening. So you wanna be a positive influence. And if you're the kind of person who just can't help but say something, just ignore, walk away, don't say anything at all, please. Because uh, some farmers are just cannot, should not be advocates, I'm sorry. Uh, worst comes to worst, block, hide, delete. So um, <clears throat> you can actually block a person from your social media if they're cause harassing you. Um, sometimes I will hide comments, to be honest with you. Um, it's maybe someone will ask a question that's a little bit controversial or a little bit uh, sensitive. And my followers are awesome, but not everyone responds maybe as politely and patiently as I do. Um, so when I have time, I'll go back and I'll unhide it and answer it in a, in a proper polite way. Um, and thank you for the people who do help me with social media and do uh, reply politely. You guys are awesome. And delete comments, don't do it very often, but uh, if you need to, you need to. And if someone says something really horrible, threatening, uh, wants you dead or something, take a screenshot, report it to the platform, report it to the police. They will take it seriously. Uh, reach out to organizations like uh, Farm and Food Care, Agriculture More Than Ever. Uh, they will help you uh, give you tips on how to educate, uh, what to do if you are attacked. Um, so there's lots of support out there. You can reach out to me too if you need help. Form Alliances Online. I have a small group of advocates that I'm friends with, and um, we do help each other behind the scenes. It's, thankfully, we don't need it very often, but we do. And finally, shut it down or keep it personal. So you can actually, um, if you have a public page, you can unpublish it. I've never had the nerve to do it, to be honest with you, but you can unpublish it and publish it again later and just don't have to deal with it. Take a break, walk away. Or if being public is not your thing, just be an advocate to your friends and family or, or at a fair or to your neighbor over the fence. And a couple slides left, and I've realized that uh, there's things I cannot change. I, I did talk to a therapist once, and they were surprised that uh, I had a job where I um, am so out of control with the nature and environment and animals, yet I'm such a controlling person. I want things to go my way. So to be able to let go of that is, has been a real challenge. And to summarize, um, we need to reduce our stress levels. Of course, we all do. And through that, by exercise and farming doesn't always count. Like I said, you get cardiovascular, uh, real life connections. So social media, people get maybe too involved in their laptops and computers and cell phones, but you need to try to, to get those real life connections. A little bit of a challenge now, but, but hang on, it'll come. Take a break or do what you love. Um, you know, like I said about doing the rock picking earlier, uh, doing something for someone else, volunteering not only helps you, it helps other people. Uh, educate yourself, um, so so you need to know um, how to help yourself with your mental health, and, and you'll recognize how to help others. And I know some other speakers in this little series have been able to do that. Um, and then get yourself help, help others in need. Don't just sit back and say someone else is going to do it. And finally, accept who you are. So if you're on social media, everyone's personal Facebook pages look like they have the perfect life and the perfect world, but we all really don't. So you need to accept that, that you are yourself and you don't need to be anybody else to anyone else. So thank you very much for having me. I really appreciated being able to share my story and share my thoughts about mental health. Um, I'm not a professional on mental health. Like I said, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So um, if you're feeling the need to talk to someone, I, I please for, for me, for your agriculture, or for your family, please do that. Thank you very much. Wow, Tim, you gave us a lot of information there. I'm gonna give you a minute to uh, have a drink of water and, and uh, just prepare yourself before we uh, ask people to uh, uh, send some questions in. I'm going to launch our poll right now, and I would really appreciate it if everybody could do it. It's literally very simple, yes and no. Uh, and multiple choice questions and it takes literally like a minute or two to do and it really helps us um, to be able to determine if we're going in the right direction with our webinars and to be able to do more of this in the future. So Tim, are you all rehydrated there? I am, I think so, it's pretty good actually. <laughs> I hope I didn't um, ramble on too much. No, it was wonderful, wonderful and much needed. Um, I do have, uh, Two questions here for you. Um, okay. uh, the first one is if your kids were children aged four or five years of old, 
of age would you show them on social media? Would I? Hmm, that's a tricky one. So um, there's a difference between uh, public social media and your own personal social media, of course, right? So people can choose what they do in their own own personal one, and some are pretty strict. Strict that um, on the public one. Uh, it's up to you. I try to stay fairly anonymous in general. That's why it's Farmer Tim, not uh, Tim May, as you know. And and even today, I didn't really, if you look close, you can probably figure out where I live, but I, I try to be very cautious about where I am. Um, even sharing photos, you know, like some people randomly like, oh, there's some belted Galloway cows. I wonder if that's where you live. And my community knows who I am. Um, but I guess it depends on your, on your, on your level of, um, I don't know, how comfortable you feel. Um, for me, I, I probably would. Uh, you, I think it gives agriculture more of a real true face. And I said, majority of people are pretty awesome. Like, I don't think there's not, I don't know, like I said, if you don't go out of your way to cause controversy and you don't try to poke the bear, I think most people are pretty supportive. Um, and activists, you know, they have a, a big bark. Uh, their bite isn't always as, as strong as you may think it is, but it's always important to be careful on your comfort level, but personally, um, I probably wouldn't have an issue with it because I think people want to see your family, want to see um, the human side of agriculture, and it also buffers you to realize that you're a family person, you're a community person, that you love your family, and if anything, that gives you a little bit more of a safety net than just being an individual uh, person. Good, good. Uh, we have a second question here, but I think I'm going to do this one for you, uh, Tim. It's uh, oh, what sir. is what is PEI? So, uh, Carlos, uh, the PEI stands for Prince Edward Island. It is uh, the smallest island province in Canada, away on the east coast. And uh, so, I'm the one that was hosting the webinar series. And uh, Farmer Tim, he lives in Ontario. So, I, I hope I've answered that question for you. Um, I'm hoping everyone else will have uh, a few more questions for us here and uh, you know, feel free to ask this gentleman as many questions as you'd like. He's been a, a farming advocate for a long time and on social media. So if you have some questions in that regard, that would be, uh, uh, this would be a great time to ask someone who will be able to give you some tried and true methods as to what, uh, what does work and what doesn't work. And thank you to everyone who showed up today. That's awesome. I am going to take advantage of you here, Tim, and, and ask another question. Um, so I know you have two, uh, two kids yourself. And uh, when you look at them and you think about young people getting involved in agriculture, what would you, what advice would you give to someone young wanting to get into agriculture, whether they have a farming background or not, or not? What would you, uh, what would you tell them if they said, Hey, Hey Tim, I'd like to start a farm. Yeah. So that's a good question. I, I belong to a lot of farm chat sites and every once in a while, someone will come on and say, Hey, I'm from the, I'm from the city or I'm not from a farm or I, I like to get into agriculture. What advice can you give? And, uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a tough battle, depending what you want to get into. But some farmers are pretty harsh. Like, they're not very supportive, to be honest with you. They're like, you know, oh, don't get into it. You know, I, I, you're going to hate it. And I'm thinking, well, you're doing it. Like, what does that say, right? So um, I think a lot of farmers are very supportive. Um, I, think, I think in Ontario, it's like one in six or one out of eight jobs. Or no, I think there's six or eight jobs for every one who graduates from... Um, in agriculture right now. So there's so many jobs out there. And the job in agriculture isn't just about farming, right? So to have a dairy farm is really hard to get into. I, I've had friends that have gotten into it, you know, like an older couple has no family to pass it on to. You may be able to make a deal, but it's, it's still a challenge, right? Or working a couple jobs and farming to make ends meet. But it's so much more than farming. There's like the research component, the uh, nutritionist component. Um, there's, it's just, all encompassing, you, you don't really realize. Even our milk truck driver is part of agriculture, right? The, feed, the, the milk grading and stuff like that, uh, food processing, it all is an, encompassed in agriculture. Um, when I graduated from Guelph, very small number of our my classmates went into farming. A lot of them went into research, a lot of them went into sales. So there's so many options out there. Um, if, you, if you can get to volunteer on a farm or, um, or work on a farm, there's a lot of farmers looking for extra help. 
Um, sometimes it's harder to get in now if you don't know somebody, but but uh, don't be feel afraid to do that volunteering. Um, it's a great experience. And uh, I think if you really try hard at it, you can do it. Uh, agriculture is strong. It's a, an amazing industry and um, and it's we need everyone we can get. So if anyone's really wanting that, that badly to get in agriculture, I want them to be there to do it. I like that answer. I like it very much. Um, we were starting to get a few questions here pop up, Tim. So we'll, um, here's your here's one for you. As an advocate for mental health, you have been open about your own journey. What advice would you give to those still grappling with the fear of reaching out? Hmm, that's a tough one. Um, you know, it depends as you as an individual and what kind of support group you have. Um, if you have your have a family around you, um, you know they're probably your first uh, people you need to talk to, or or a good friend or or neighbor. Um, and I think they would, anyone who you talk to would probably encourage you to, to seek extra help. But I think the hurdle is, is within yourself, right? If you, the first step is recognizing it. So if you, this person asking a question, for example, recognizes they have mental health issues, that's the first step. Some people don't realize it, you know, maybe being a little angrier than normal or, or, or having headaches or feeling tired all the time. You might think it's just part of the weather or, or something, and it could be but it could be something deeper. So you have to recognize it first. And if you get that far along, I think the next step is to talk to someone, maybe a doctor. Um, they're pretty good. People are pretty good at recognizing mental health. So um, the next step is pretty much up to you. And I think once you do it, and once you get out there and you realize that the stigma isn't really there anymore and people are pretty supportive, I think uh, you'll feel a lot better and the journey will go well. And it, it varies all across this uh, country as to what avenues that you can go to to uh, access mental health. So definitely it's, it's don't be afraid to ask questions or ask someone. Um, there's also uh, 911, there's uh, Canadian Suicide Services. There's a lot of really good services that are toll free that you can call as well. Um, it, so definitely uh, reach out and, and talk to somebody. Uh, we have another question here. We have uh, someone asking, how would you advise a young person who's passionate about agriculture to become an advocate? Oh, that's another great question. So, um, like I said, um, an advocate comes in all forms, right? So there's people like me who are quite vocal on public social media. Um, it's not for everybody. Like I said, there's, there are some stresses that go with it. And they don't really get you know, some people like, you know, are selling shirts and calendars and stuff like that and maybe making money on it. And, and every week I get people offering to do advertising on it and I don't know what's a scam and what's not. So I, I don't get into that. I just do it because it's a hobby and I'm passionate about it. But I'd start off like I did with my own family and friends. Um, uh, if you're on social media, I know a lot of, I used to be, well, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram, but I don't post much on there anymore. So so limit to what you love. The young people want to be on Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok these days, which, which I've seen some great stuff on there. So whatever you're comfortable with, um, it doesn't have to be public. So like I said, you can just do it to your friends and family. It's a little safer that way. I have lots of friends and relatives that are not involved in agriculture that, that love to hear what happens on the farm. Um, volunteer at a, at a, at a fair. Um, doing egg, egg education once COVID opens up, we'll be back into doing that. I think that's a great way to do it. Get to know your neighbors. Um, what I did, uh, one of the best things I did was to introduce myself to my local community um, nearby in my local town. And, and when I went onto their Facebook page, I realized there weren't really any farmers on there and there's so much misinformation going on. And now I've, they've known me so well, I'll share some of my posts on there that they'll actually contact me and say, hey, what's the answer to this or what's the answer to that? So everybody needs a farmer in their life, right? So, so I just take baby steps and, um, and reach out to other advocates. So they're, they're pretty good. I, to be honest, I don't have a lot of time to look at other people's social media. Um, there's some great uh, Canadian ones out there, Sandy Brock, uh, like I said, Leslie Kelly. Um, Sandy talks about her sheep farming in Ontario. She does an amazing uh, YouTube stuff. And if you reach out to them for tips and tips, they, they might even like give you a shout out. If you wanna go public, hey, if you have a, a public page and you're young and you're doing a great job educating and you're not poking the bear, I hate it when people poke the bear, then send me a, a, a message and I'll give you a shout out. So I think we, we're here for each other, so. 
Good advice. Um, I have another question here for you. Um, this individual is asking, how can the average person, a non-farming person, best support farmers in the area? Hmm, well, so depending on what country you're listening from, so I'll speak to Canadians at the moment, um, support local. So um, for dairy farming, for example, uh, we have the Little Blue, Blue Cow Program and not to bash my neighbors south of the border you know they work hard to make a good product too um, but we have this little blue cow that that shows the work behind what we do so no matter what farm you go to in canada we all have the same uh, the same uh, strict standards and stuff so that little blue cow shows you that it's canadian it's local um, and that's the best thing you can do is with your with your buying dollar um, and if you know a farming neighbor you know introduce yourself um, maybe if you have a question about what they're doing like why are you spraying that crop or what is that you're doing or or why are you working at all hours of the night you know instead of like wondering and, and being annoyed go talk to them and ask them because we're we're pretty approachable and um i don't know just just get to know your farming community because uh we're busy we do keep to ourselves it's partly because we're busy but we also are like i said part of the community we're your neighbors um so Get to know your farmer, get to know your neighbors, go to farmer's markets. Um, when you go to the store, try to buy um, your representative product for your country. Good. I've got uh, another question here for you uh, from, I believe the gentleman from uh, Portugal is asking this one. And he's wanting to know, do you plan to communicate forever? So I think he's wondering <laughs> if, your, uh, if your Facebook and social media status, you, do you plan to do this for a long time or? Ooh, that's a good question. Eh? So, um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. So it's, it's kind of like it draws you in. So there's, there's times where I'm thinking, you know, um, I think about stepping away and, you know, I talked about the activists and stuff like that. And like I said, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, you just kind of want to shut it down and just forget about it. Um, I'm not I'm actually a pretty shy person, believe it or not. I, I don't like a lot of attention. So I do kind of keep to myself and, and don't really want people to know who I am or where I live and stuff like that. But, uh, but there is something about when people send you a message saying, you know, um, and it's happened a couple of times that maybe it's a vegan. I don't really care about food choices. She'll say it's because of you. I realize that not all farmers are bad and this, this treat their animals. So I've added like dairy back into my diet or another person said, it's because of something you said today, uh, it saved my life. And that's like unbelievably overwhelming. Right. So, um, these little things pull you back and you feel like you're making a difference. Um, and you may not always see the difference you make, but, but, but I, but trust me, like my other presentation I do gives examples of some of these, uh, these differences you make. It's, but for example, that the, I live because you farm campaign, stuff like that, you know, you're making small differences in people's lives. So, um, as long as I can do that, or I feel like I'm doing that, I'll likely stay with it probably the younger people will fall off and Facebook probably disappear. So I'll have to branch out into some of these other venues, but uh, they'll have to turn into old man farmer, Tim, I think eventually. We'll see you on TikTok drinking a, a glass of milk <laughs> as you're walking a cow to the barn. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of my kids have been great. They've been great at supporting me with, uh, with some of that kind of stuff and the technology. Oh my. Well, I, um, Oh, Oh, I was just about to say let's stop but we've got another question here for you um i'm a big fan of your facebook page i think we all are but uh this individual is wanting to know do you have a favorite post that you've ever made oh that's a tough one favorite post um i don't know personally i <laughs> personally if you guys know me on social media i i started off mostly with like myths and misconceptions and and science actually shows that the more you try to battle myths and misconceptions the worse it makes them so um i try to hide little facts and and, and stuff in my posts now and and every once in a while i'll do a, a miss busting one even though you're not really supposed to do it it gets you lots of followers and gets people all heated up but it's i'm not there for followers i'm there to to make a difference right so um and i like to have fun and i don't know some of my, <laughs> my family makes fun of my puns and my wife, to be honest, she hates my puns. She doesn't laugh at them. Um, and uh, so anytime I get to put a pun out there, it kind of is this big relief. So uh, I'm sorry if I punish you with them, but uh, it's something I really enjoy. 
So anything that has a, a something fun in it is probably what I enjoy most. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm scared to say something now. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, let's see. Oh, Julia is saying thank you for the great webinar and, and thank you very much for participating. Um, if we don't have any more questions, I think we'll wrap this up. Uh, I think Vanella might be waiting for, uh, for a visit from Farmer Tim, but uh, I do want to say thank you to all the participants who came and uh, did the poll and, and listened to everything. Uh, I think we all need to say a big thank you to Abby for uh, coming in and helping there a couple of times, and uh, definitely. She is. <laughs> Abby. And, and thank you very much, Farmer Tim, for uh, taking a chance and, and going in and doing this uh, 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 webinar with us. Uh, you know, we're, we're both a little technologically challenged, so to be able to pull this off without, uh, you know, lightning bolts from the sky, I think we did pretty, pretty spectacularly. Uh, for everyone else, uh, please, in the future, as I mentioned, we are recording this and it will be on our uh, YouTube channel. Please drop in and, and see that and share with everyone else. If you have any questions or any suggestions for other speakers, please uh, send us an email at farmsafety at eifa.ca. And thank you very much. Support farming, support each other, and be kind. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And uh, a shout out to my family for their, their help, my wife and my son and my, my daughter. And a shout out to you, Crystal, did a great job and helped calm my nerves. And you know, I might actually do this again sometime. So it was great. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who tuned in and, and, uh, and your support uh, to farmers in, in no matter what country you live in and for us social media people without uh, the, the followers like you guys, um, we wouldn't be able to, we would have no one to post to. And we wouldn't have that uh, that support. So thank you very, very much.